please welcome Ted. Uh, good morning. I'm really uh, honored to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you today about our, uh, our work using zebrafish and a picture up here of a common pet store fish, a very hardy little animal, probably in some of your aquaria at home and, or niece, your nieces or nephews' aquaria. And um, I did want to certainly begin with acknowledging um, Alberta Innovates and the Alberta Prion Research Institute. Um, our funding's uh, partnership with um, the Alberta Prion Research Institute, as well as Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories. And uh, the funding they've provided us has really been transformative in the way we think about these diseases. And um, they've really recruited all these amazing researchers who've taught us so much about um, how we can use the zebrafish in, in uh, unique ways. So as Jay mentioned, the uh, prion diseases have been so impactful in Alberta affecting our economy in terms of closures of borders to beef exports and in chronic wasting diseases, um, healthy deer end up looking less and less healthy and um, the disease is marching across Alberta towards our beautiful uh, national parks. <clears throat> the um, end stage of disease in prion disease ends up much like something that's sadly more familiar to many of you is, is things like Alzheimer's disease. So in prion disease, as Jay mentioned, we um, begin with kind of a, a happy, normally folded protein, and it ends up changing its shape. And that change in shape ends up actually being able to induce other properly folded proteins to then change shape as well. And that uh, leads to the protein spreading through the brain. It leads to neurons dying. It leads to memory loss. It leads to um, confusion and dementia. It can even lead to things like seizures. And the parallels um, in these end-stage dementias are then reflected also what we see at the cellular level. So as these proteins spread through the brain, uh, we see a, a, beginning, a beginning stage of, um, pardon me, <clears throat> We see a, a, a stage where the disease will begin in a focal point and then slowly spread through the brain. And this was first known to occur in prion diseases and now is known to happen with proteins in prion disease as well as in Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, and even uh, other diseases such as schizophrenia. And so we become really curious about um, whether there's other links other than these important parallels I've talked about here between prion disease and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to tell you that, in fact, the, the properly folded proteins in prion disease and Alzheimer's disease probably are playing important roles interacting with each other in healthy brains. We think in understanding the roles of these pro proteins in healthy brains is really important as we try to develop therapeutics and diagnostics. So let me introduce you to the zebrafish. So the zebrafish is a um, very common fish, very hardy, easy to grow, and we have um, thousands and thousands of these in our laboratory. They become popular as a complement to a mouse model in a lab, and as sort of a compromise between the thousands and thousands of um, small animals you could have, like a fruit fly. You can have a lab full of millions of fruit flies, or a lab full of dozens of mice, or you can have a a lab full of dozens or uh, thousands of zebrafish, and we can breed them very efficiently and have very um, powerful genetic systems in them. So the, the genome of the zebrafish is, is fully sequenced and uh, very well characterized. We can manipulate the genome and insert genes and take out genes, affect the protein abundance very efficiently. One of the amazing aspects of the zebrafish is that it's very transparent, and we can see right into the organism and it grows very quickly. It grows quickly outside of the organism, so we don't have a placenta in the way. It grows quickly from a tiny little fish to, a, to an adult. And as you watch here, uh, a, a recently fertilized egg. This would be a yolk, like a chicken yolk. And the cells developing on top of the yolk. You see the time passing here in hours. Now up to thousands of cells. And these animals very quickly, over the course of only three days, now we're developing into these um, fully functioning little fish. We can line up thousands and thousands of these fish. Pardon me, wrong button again. 
we can line up thousands of these fish in, in our um, trays and deliver the uh, proteins to them <clears throat> such that we can now alter gene expression in many of the fishes and um, affect the protein abundance and ask our questions about Alzheimer's and prion disease uh, interacting with each other. So the zebrafish have become a popular biomedical model. They're used in things like cardiology. They're used locally in toxicology. They're used um, in aging and becoming popular in personalized medicine as well. Um, we use them as well in looking at regeneration of neural tissues. So for two questions today, I'm going to begin by thinking about what is the function of this prion protein. And then I'm going to look at similarities between the prion protein, as I mentioned, with Alzheimer's disease and see if some of those parallels can actually inspire us to think about new ideas for treatments and diagnosis. So in the first question, the, the function of prion protein is actually an interesting enigma or paradox because this prion protein, as I've said, is a template for disease. And it's really abundant in the brains of all the animals we're interested in. And it's very conserved, so evolutionarily conserved, it's abundant, and so it must be doing something important. But we don't really know what that function is. So our approach is to remove that prion protein from the zebrafish. So we've used very advanced genetic technology to remove the prion protein from um, this zebrafish on the bottom compared to the normal fish on the top. <clears throat> and I've chosen this example to highlight the amount of detail that we can see in the zebrafish. Here we've uh, made a transgenic animal where we can light up the brain with GFP, so this is a little bit of jellyfish DNA into the zebrafish, and we can exquisitely examine the detail within the fish and look at the various brain structures. Let me play that again. So looking at the brain structures, um, we don't really see very much difference within these fish, and as we zoom in, I hope that you'll appreciate that we can actually start to see uh, blood flowing and hearts beating within these animals. <clears throat> so the zebrafish, um, when we've removed this prion protein, if you're not seeing much of a difference here, we don't see much of a difference either. The prion protein removed from the zebrafish looks, um, the fish look really quite normal and quite intact. So the prion protein doesn't seem to be critical for these early developmental stages. And this is quite similar to what's been seen in mice. So as we zoom in, so here we have the eye and the various brain structures, and we can see in really great detail um, the various structures and not see too much difference between these fish. We've looked in various other contexts and hope you can appreciate that in these deeply anesthetized fish, um, we can really see even blood flowing through the brain vessels and healthy, happy looking fish. So as we move on to consider the behavior in these animals, we'll um, actually start to see differences. We had a hypothesis coming out of mice that these fish might be susceptible to seizures. Prion protein, when removed from mice, makes them susceptible to seizures. And if, David, if you could uh, skip ahead in the video. Um, and what we've done here is array these tiny zebrafish in 96 well plates, so a biotechnology standard that's very useful for us to um, screen drugs. And each little fish, we're going to um, track their movement and see if they're susceptible to a convulsant. In the top rows, we have normal fish. In the bottom rows, we have um, susceptible fish. And by tracking this movement and noting um, seizure-like behavior as they start to whirl around these little dishes, we're able to um, quantify what's happening. We have video tracking software to watch the fish as they move through these wells and get great detail. And then, in fact, when we remove prion protein from the fish, we do see a great accumulation of seizures. So again, very similar to what was observed in mice. Well, we wanted to drill down deeper into what's happening here. And we looked at the um, channels in the neurons of these zebrafish. So this is sort of akin to an EKG that your cardiologist might do on your heart. And if you want to understand if there's defects in heart function, you would notice differences in these sorts of traces. Well, indeed, we do see important differences in these traces. 
where in a normal fish, after a neuron sends a signal, it returns to baseline. But when we've removed prion protein from the system, that does not occur. And that actually is similar to research out of Calgary looking at mice, and they flip the axis here, but again, when the neuron fires, if prion protein is missing from the system, it doesn't return to baseline. The channel that we're studying here turns out to be one of the rare drug targets for Alzheimer's disease. So this maybe ties back into some of the Alzheimer's research as well. So as a take home message from this part of the talk, we've learned that the prion protein is really important in regulating how neurons fire and how they are regulated. Um, if, that, if they become deregulated, those neurons tend to die. And so this is about protecting the neurons and keeping them in a stable condition. We've learned that it's not specific to mice, but in fact that it's general to many animals. And certainly it's going to be generalizable to the deer and the cows and the people that were interested in um, studying the disease progression. <clears throat> As a final question I want to address with you is how the prion protein and the Alzheimer's proteins interact. So what we've been talking about, I've made a cartoon here of green prion protein, or green prion protein here interacting with some other proteins. And it's in the same vicinity within a cell, at the outer membrane of a cell, along with the key proteins in Alzheimer's disease. That key protein in Alzheimer's disease, if it gets cleaved in a disadvantageous way, it makes this notorious little protein called A-beta. A-beta accumulates into oligomers, and this is what becomes toxic and kills brain cells in Alzheimer's disease. These A-beta oligomers accumulate, killing cells. And then about five or six years ago, it became apparent to researchers that that A-beta actually binds very tightly to the prion protein and has some important consequences in Alzheimer's disease. So we asked the question, if this little pit of A-beta is able to bind onto the prion protein, why not ask about this, ho this holoprotein, all of APP itself, and indeed, it seems like they interact. Well, here's a snapshot of our evidence for that. If we take now a young zebrafish, about one day old, if we uh, reduce the prion protein, we don't see too much of an effect, as we've talked about. If we reduce that Alzheimer's protein, we don't see much of an effect. If we combine the two, in fact, the zebrafish is not developing well at all. The um, neurons in the brain are dying massive cell death, and the cells are not adhering together well. The zebrafish has um, another specialty. It has multiple copies of these prion protein and Alzheimer precursor protein. And what fascinates us about this is this is a very specialized niche interaction. It's only this version of the Alzheimer's protein and only this version of the prion protein that are having this interaction. And it's not something spe specific to zebrafish because we can in fact add in back into this system, now add in human Alzheimer protein or human prion protein and get back to a normal fish. We would say we're rescuing the phenotype. So whatever the specific niche interaction is between prion protein and Alzheimer's uh, precursor protein, amyloid precursor protein, whatever that niche interaction is that's so special for um, keeping neurons healthy is something that these human proteins are doing as well. So I began by saying that the uh, prion protein has taught us a lot about these other diseases, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and how they spread. And what we're now starting to realize is that, in fact, these other diseases, um, like Alzheimer's, can now teach us about these diseases so important to um, Alberta, the prion diseases, important for chronic wasting disease, mad cow disease, etc. <clears throat> and so, in summary, we have this critical prion protein interaction with this A beta, and what we've now shown is that, in fact, the hollow protein can interact with the prion protein as well. So I'm going to end there with thanking the members of my lab and many great collaborators who made this work possible. And again, thanks to Alberta Innovates, the Alberta Prion Research Institute, partnered with Alzheimer's Society of Alberta Northwest Territories. Thank you very much. So prion diseases are not, Alzheimer's, like Alzheimer's is not a prion disease, but you see this interaction. Um, 
do you think that the interaction between the, let's, let's say I've got Alzheimer's but I don't have a prion disease, so my mm. prions are normal in my brain. Do you think that they nonetheless are contributing? Do you speculate that they might be contributing to the spread of Alzheimer's, which involves different kinds of proteins in my brain? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable speculation. It's certainly a question we're very interested in. So not the misfolded prion protein that is so important in causing infectious disease, but perhaps in Alzheimer's disease, it's very important to be thinking about that normal prion protein and how it's regulating the cell and the neurons and keeping them healthy. Yeah. So another quick one. Um, if if prion, normal prions uh, sort of protect neurons, do you think that's the, that leads to the symptoms of prion diseases when the number of normal prions, because they're being converted to bad ones, is declining? Yeah, I think that that's becoming more and more evident, and that's been underestimated in prion disease. That's an argument we're really starting to make, that when that prion protein misfolds, there's been a large emphasis on that being a, a toxic gain of function, right. as you're well aware from your, from your writings. Um, but in fact, it is probably as important to think about that that's losing its function when it misfolds. Hmm. Yeah. Very cool.